benefit of attending today and in future years is instant and full access of the research report and executive summaries, which are in English and Spanish. You now have that through your RSVP. You also have it on your executive summaries via a QR code. So we want you to share that with the world. And by the way, this is a, there's a hashtag for this event, Stanford S-O-L-E, Seoul, State of Latino Entrepreneurship. So we hope that you share that wide to all your networks. Now, it's an honor to introduce our panel, which features alumni of the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative Education Scaling Program. And I can tell you that our chairman, Victor Arias, chairman emeritus, uh, Professor uh, uh, Jerry Porras, our board and our team, we get really energized and orgullosos, proud, to report that we have achieved critical mass as now we have 584 graduates of this program. If you are a Slay Ed alumni, please stand to be recognized. Please stand to be recognized. Wow, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> So we have a little factoid. We have a 94% graduation rate for this group, right? <laughs> you should hashtag that. Uh, so we're very proud of them. And a little bit more about this group, 584 strong, employing over 30,000 across 31 states in Puerto Rico. Listen to this, combined annual gross revenues for this group, north of $3.02 billion. So if you do the math, the mean is 5.17 million per business. So we are very proud of this group. Now it's time for our panel. Our moderator, Marty Chavez, is a computer scientist, investor, risk manager, and serial entrepreneur. Over the past 19 years, he has held multiple roles as partner, management committee member, and senior leader of Goldman Sachs, including CFO, CIO, and global co-head of the firm's largest and most complex business, the securities division. And he is also today a lecturer here at Stanford GSB. Our entrepreneurs, let me tell you about these folks. Latino entrepreneur, CEO, and founder of Wild Earth, Ryan Bethencourt, who is leading the plant-based sustainable food industry is, and is noteworthy for having backing by the one and only Mark Cuban. Latino entrepreneur, president, and CEO of BEPC Inc., Oscar Casillas, who continues to be one of the most successful Latino entrepreneurs in securing corporate procurement with Fortune 500s. Latina entrepreneur and CEO of Abardas Health, Dolmari Mendez, who is transforming the entire healthcare landscape in Puerto Rico. And last but not least, Latina entrepreneur, CEO and founder of AgTools, Martha Montoya, who is revolutionizing the global agricultural industry with breakthroughs in technology. We welcome the panel. Thank you. Let's, let's sit under our faces. <laughs> Why don't you sit over here? Right? Yeah. Sorry, I tend to not go to conventions. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> all right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. It was a huge delight for me to get to know uh, these entrepreneurs who have all built very different businesses. So I won't claim um, that you're going to get a representative sample of all the businesses that were in the survey, um, but they really are quite different and have faced different challenges and also some of them that are the same. And so I thought we would key off the results of the study as a way of guiding um, our discussion, but really uh, keep the focus entirely on these amazing entrepreneurs and on their experience. So, one of the observations in the study was the revenue growth rate of Latino-owned businesses, 14%, um, substantially outpacing the growth rate of the U.S. economy. Fascinating result. And so let's just start with something that every entrepreneur cares about, uh, which is driving revenue growth. So I thought I'd start with you, Dolmarie. Why don't you tell us about where you are in your business 
and revenue growth and what some of your challenges have been and advice. Advice. <laughs> so um, thank you for having us today here. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here sharing our story. Um, now we are in the growth stage. We are crossing over from Puerto Rico, which is a very uh, significant, and to the with two five hundred Fortune five hundred companies as a client, two pharmaceuticals, and to with a national contract to the for the fifty states, and so something from Puerto Rico, the making um, happen, making it happen in Puerto Rico is something and something like that is very difficult, especially because we are. Latina women in the healthcare and tech space, and that is a challenge. So I have to tell you that um, that first we we went through incubator, accelerator, and mentoring. So we kept all our mentors since the incubator until now. It is exactly what we are doing now with the in the as part of the cohort seven, and I think I can tell that that was a key for everything. We use every 100% of our mentors, 100%. So I can tell you that that was the game changer in our case, because in Puerto Rico, yes, we have mentors, but I cannot find that kind of mentors everywhere, in every corner. Mm -hmm. So having the exposure to incubators, accelerators, and try to get every available grant that we have as a women-owned company, Latina, with all these disadvantages that we have, that we are classified, we use all those disadvantages as advantages, mm -hmm. okay? So we are not into the drama. So we use all the available <laughs> money out there. Just, I'm like a Latina woman, tech, healthcare. I have all the boxes checked to fail. So that is our inspiration every day. And we use every um, mentor, Every, um, we, in, we raised capital in 2018. We raised 1.5 million after we won the South by West company. That was a competition that was a game changer for us. Mm -hmm. And then we learned, we started to learn about all this. But the people that were like taking their time to teach us were the mentors. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're not a mentor, if you don't use your mentors, if you're not open to feedback, and you are not able to pass the knowledge to your team, you're gonna fail. So that's the best advice that I can um, give to everybody here. Mentoring and, and knowledge transfer and, and be open to all the feedback that you, that you can get, positive, negative, and take it from there and make Marie, it work. Question it on positive. your mentors, were they, were they women, men, Latino, Latina. Oh my God, I don't even know how many mentors I have. Okay. I have like a whole list. I keep all the, the, the investors that are after the company, tracking the company with quarterly updates, and we keep them involved in our process in every stage that we are. We just closed three million round while we were here, and it was a tough round, and I used my mentor assigned in the program to raise my capital to like raise the for the whole process because we did it while we were here right. and we just closed that um like um by september 30th that was a closing day and i was here so i used mark and everybody in the team <laughs> as part of my process and don marie as i understand you've also hired a couple of men along the way in your company you want to talk about that <laughs> yeah. we're we are 27 and we are two women co-founders oh. and 25 guys. They're happy. They like it. <laughs> <laughs> they are happy. What do you want, boss, today? Happy to serve you. Yeah, we have a good combination. Puerto Rico is a cultural, <laughs> uh, now it's very um, diverse because we have tax, tax incentives yeah. and we are under uh, a tax incentive um, agreement with the government too because the government is our sponsor. Mm -hmm. and, and I have Jewish, Russian, um, what else? Puerto Ricans, I have people from the state, so it's a very diverse group. But and one uh, last quick question before we, we move on to, to Martha. On the mentors, I'm always curious about this, and I know many of us have this experience, so I, I get 
maybe 100 requests a day on the internet for mentoring, right? Would you please have dinner with me? Would you please have coffee? I'd get really caffeinated if I did that. And so my, my question is, what, what do the mentors get out of it, yes. right? So that it's a two-way street. So usually, uh, you don't need to be, uh, I'm, I'm talking about my ex very personal experience, you don't need to um, like be a successful investor, multi-billionaire, multi-millionaire. You can pass your knowledge since you are in the first stage because you can help the others that are going to start that process. So that um, being able to just share that experience with, with someone else, it makes you a mentor because you're just letting them know what you went through in order to, to be where you are now, and you can learn, it depends on your mindset. And so uh, mentors and investors are available for every stage. So um, when we were in our technology development, we had an early, super early stage investor that he knows that healthcare it takes time to make money in healthcare. So everyone in healthcare and tech knows that they have to wait for their money. It's not coming back that fast, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe like three, five years. But now we got an, a, an investor that is not an early stage investor. He's in FinTech, healthcare, from New Zealand. I'm in Puerto Rico, how that, how that happened? Again, because a mentor put me in contact with another right. mentor right. that brought me that investor. Because you need to find your investor. Someone like, um, you cannot get money from like every investor. There are investors for every stage. Yes. And you need, so in our case, we needed someone that was like, okay, working with women. I have a 20 month old baby and an 11 year old. My apartment partner has a six month old, another 10 and eight. Yes, we're like kind of crazy because we raise capital pregnant, but they love it. So we were, we are, um, well, I raised money um, pregnant, told them I am pregnant. You cannot see it, but I'm seven months pregnant. Uh, not now. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, you're good. Oh, no. <laughs> you're <laughs> <an investor. laughs> And they were like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he was like, okay. Yeah. Is that a problem? No. We are here at this point. We cannot oh, cancel the whole Rather than a process. problem, it's, it's, it's inspiring. Yes. So. And, now, <laughs> yeah. and now with this one, my partner was pregnant. Again, another pregnant woman. <laughs> and they were, okay, it's fine. So um, you, that is a thing that you need to, your investor, they need to be involved. Your mentors, they need to be involved. And they need to understand that stage that you are. Because the reality is that the man that they don't have the same experiences and the same process that we have as women when you have to raise capital. Yes. It's, it's not pretty at all. It's very, it's a rocky, rocky road. And yet you have done it. So Martha, why don't you tell us about some of your experiences and a little bit about your company and in driving revenue growth and whatever you want to tell us. I think my role is a, a little bit different because I'm a little bit older than you. <laughs> a little bit. Um, having been around doing business before, the traditional way um, was uh, an eye opener when I came to Stanford because I was told you have to think big. Mm -hmm. um, and so we decided, all me, my whole team, that we're going to do 10 steps back to move forward. The whole Silicon Valley, the whole world of the new economies, the technology. And so the decision was tough to shut down everything we're doing in millions of dollars sales, but making very teeny little barren margins, um, even though with the procurement mentorship that we have in corporate America. And so our job, my job was to come back to school and become a student. And that took me a while, because remember, I know it all, supposedly. And then went to UC Davis to confirm my business plan, to ratify my business plan, because I'm in the ag industry. Yes. So one thing is Stanford and Silicon Valley and the billions of dollars, and the ag industry is a completely different industry. Are you in the ag industry or the machine learning industry? Agricultural industry is my industry, so I've been all over the world developing crops for many corporations. Uh, you can name the country and you can name the crop, and most likely I have done it. Yeah. Uh, from carrots to potatoes to onions, you name it, I have been around. 
And, and so coming back and deciding to uh, do this was two things. One, I saw the economy. I said, technology is the next trend. And if I stay here, we stay here in this, and I say we because there's a whole team behind me. It's a, it's a whole business, people. Uh, if we stay here, we're going to grow very slow. Yes. Well, if we go into the technology industry, maybe we're going to grow higher. And that's when, I repeat, I did the study here, and the scalability, the famous scalability, and then moved to UC Davis and eventually launched the company. And that allows, the technology allows us to do a global thinking versus just doing shipments from different, only from certain regions. Mm -hmm. And then the second part was adapting to work with younger people because that's where the technology is, younger people. And we're, we're our way, we're baby boomers, we know what we're doing, we have been doing it this way. And so as a Latina or Latinos, I have seen this going through, we have been doing it too long for so, so much, and how do we shift? And now all our engineers are 21, 22, 23, 24, mm -hmm. and those are the ones creating what we're doing and letting them be free but having some rails of business to let them operate under the business understanding that I have, uh, and that's how the growth we're moving into. Where are those engineers located? They're in rural United States. They're in Wenatchee, Washington. They're in Salinas, California. They're in Los Reyes, Michoacan. Wow. Yeah, so wonderful engineers. I'm so proud of them. Some of them, I mean, they're computer science engineers that had no internet access. Oh. So they know how to code by hand. So the creativity is there. That was another asset. And also because we couldn't afford to pay uh, engineers in right. Silicon Valley. <laughs> so, yeah. so even when you sit in front of investors and say, okay, what is the equivalent of, oh, well, four engineers the equivalent of one yeah. in Silicon Valley. So it is fun to have only Latino engineers throughout this whole process of coding. And um, my brother is the one who leads the whole pack. Okay. He was one of the first engineers of Amazon. He was grabbed from Silicon Valley to Seattle, and okay. so he had that. So he's way. the draw. In, uh, he is the draw. And the patience, because we both come from families of uh, educators. So we have the understanding of how to train uh, people and how to entice them. So it's been super fun. curious. How did, you, how did you find machine learning and computer scientists in Michoacan? Well, to begin with, in Wanachi, Washington, uh, when the Bitcoin uh, came, became a big thing, uh, Wanachi, Washington is the center point of the uh, Bitcoin. And so all this uh, farming, it used to go down the valley and you see farming uh, Apple farms. Now you see blocks of buildings which are the farming of all these clouds. Yep. And so you, Washington University opened uh, uh, the school uh, for machine learning for people from kids to move from Seattle to Wenatchee and nobody was moving. So they had to go to the local colleges and guess where the local colleges? The kids who harvested apples and cherries which happened to be Hispanics. Oh, wow. And so that has been one of our blessings having this amazing Hispanic kids with ML and AI, which is unique. And then in uh, Wenatchee, Washington, and in Los Reyes, Michoacan, and with Salinas, we're training them on the ML. They're in the coding side of it, but, but it's just a unique thing. And um, we have an angel investor who's the leader, who was the pioneer of machine learning and artificial intelligence, a Latina, on top of that. So it's everything has been a Latina process. So is your business model, that, that's unbelievable, <laughs> <Thank> right? <laughs> Fantastic. It, t t tell us a little bit about your business model. Is it enterprise sales? Is it subscriptions? How so do you it is, um, I have to say, this is like the Bloomberg dashboard. Okay. But of the fruits and vegetables. Worked out well for Bloomberg. Yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for the call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is the, is the Bloomberg. It is, you, you can see the fruits and vegetables, nuts and herbs moving all over the world. Uh, it used to be that we used to eat only the fruits and vegetables of the season. And now as consumers, we want to see it the whole year. Yep. So the market moves continuously. So we have data from all over official uh, governments and uh, entities. They're plugged in. And so in milliseconds, you can see how the potato business is doing where, how the carrot business is doing there, how the coffee, we just got hired for S&D Coffee, one of the largest uh, uh, roasters company in the world, to the coffee portion of it and so on and so forth. So it's a per seat license for it's the a license dashboard? Fee. Yeah. And then also it's a dashboard and now it's a monitor. They're, we're installing the monitors in the different- Is it $30,000 per year per person like Bloomberg? It's starting to be good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's starting That's to be smart. good. That's amazing. That's beautiful. Oscar, let's, uh, let's go on to you. Can you tell us about your business and revenue growth and how you're driving it? Uh, well, I, I, I worked for a major corporation for about 30 years and then 
after that, I decided to just venture out on my own and I took that leap of faith and said, you know, I need to start my own consulting business. So uh, they became my first client uh, about three weeks after I left the company. I was back working for them as a consultant. Uh, and as we uh, needed additional engineers to work on different projects to help uh, validate and qualify uh, manufacturing equipment, uh, and I'm talking about manufacturing equipment that manufactures medical devices and pharmaceutical products. Uh, so these are large pieces of equipment that are used in, in manufacturing operations uh, in, in, in the U.S. and Mexico. So I basically, as, as they needed more engineers, I began to add more engineers through my company. So my, my first year, my first three years was, uh, I guess, pretty tough, but uh, we were about 25 people uh, in my first three years. And Oscar, uh, can you tell us about that toughness? Like, what was it liquidity? Was it lack of financing? What, what was it? Was, uh, it was, yeah, it was uh, having, the, having the money to be able to do your, make payroll yeah. every week, you know? So, how did you do that? I, I just pray. I was on a very low budget myself. <laughs> so, I, uh, you know, I, I just invested whatever profits that we were getting, I just reinvested back into the company mm -hmm. and used that money to, to make payroll every week. And so every week it was, you know, we were on short payment terms, so it, we were able to turn around, you know, the money that was coming in and, and make payroll. Uh, so that really helped us a lot. Um, I, I went to a local bank after a few years and uh, opened up a line of credit. And, and I'm talking about years after uh, and so one of the first things that they ask when you're looking for money is uh, what do you have for collateral you know so either you can put up your house or you can put up your accounts receivables which at that time uh, more recently our accounts receivables were in good shape so we used the accounts receivables to be able to uh, open up a line of credit that helped us uh, as we continue to grow at what period of, we said a couple years? It was, the first three years were just really tough. We'd finance our own. And I'm talking about 10 years after when we really had a huge spurt in our growth uh, is when I, I had to go out and seek a line of credit. But throughout all those years, uh, we were self-funded, self-financed, you know. So I never went and got a loan to do my, uh, to make payroll and pay bills and all that. It was all just taking the money that was coming in and reinvesting it back into the company. You didn't use credit cards or loans from family members? We used uh, American Express uh, credit cards. And uh, the good thing about that is you can pay after 30 days. So some of our payment terms were like 30 days. Yes. So it was like, you know, you get, wow. your, <laughs> you get your money, you make Carefully your payment. Carefully timed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, so it, it was it was tough, but uh, one of never missed payroll. Never missed payroll. Wow. Never, never missed payroll. And that's what I told uh, my staff when I started hiring staff. I said, you know what? Um, one of the things that that you all will understand is that we will never miss payroll. You know, we may not pay ourselves, we may not pay some bills, but we will never miss payroll. Mm -hmm. You know, because people depend on their checks, you know, and some people, uh, unfortunately, live, you know, on paycheck to paycheck and stuff. So they have to have the money every week, you know. So we make sure that we, and, and to, to this day, we have never, never missed a payroll. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> So tell, us, so tell us about your revenue growth. Who, who's driving that? Do you, are you the, the principal sales? We team? have... Uh, yeah, we, we, we just, we, we do a lot of networking. And one of the first things, one of the things that I found is that we need to diversify. So my, my first client, um, you know, the, the, they continued to support us big time. But I knew that uh, we had to diversify our company. So we started an IT division of our company uh, because we knew that the technology was changing. Uh, even, even for the medical device and, and the pharmaceutical companies, Automation is coming in, new technology is coming in. So we knew that we needed to diversify into that field. So we started an IT division back in 2010. 
and uh, we knew that uh, it was going to be difficult because that's not my background. So I hired the talent. I hired the, the, the people that had the skill sets uh, to be able to drive that division. And now that division uh, this year will probably be, be about 40% of our sales uh, for, for our total company. So that division is outpacing our life science division now. Uh, and uh, and we're, we're, in, in, uh, we're doing, with the diversification, we're doing business in 40 states in the U.S. now. So we're registered to do business in 40 states and uh, all of Mexico. So we, we're, we're right now uh, have about 220 employees in Mexico. And uh, we cover all the way from Reynosa uh, on the border from Texas all the way uh, to Ciudad Juarez, where we have our largest concentration of engineers. Uh, we're doing projects in Nogales. And just recently, in December, we opened an office in Tijuana. So we're covering the, there's a huge opportunity in those uh, areas because medical device and pharmaceutical companies are moving into that, that area. So, so the opportunities to move in there and provide the services, the engineering services that, that they're, we're good at, uh, they're, I mean, they're there. So we're, we're seeking those opportunities, you know, every day and, uh, and trying to, uh, you know, focus on some of those things that, that those companies need, you know, and, uh, and then help them. And then at the same time, they help us. How many total employees do you have now? We ended uh, December with 470 employees now. Uh, so it's been a great journey for us. Uh, one of the things that I learned through the, I know we talk about sales and increasing in sales and all that, but one of the, first, one of the things that I learned through the, uh, through the scaling program here at Stanford was um, uh, focus on profitability. You know, it's not, it's not so much, when I first came in, I said, well, we want to be a $100 million company. Well, what, is the, what good is it? being a hundred million dollar company if your profitability is really low. So focus on profitability because I think that's what's gonna drive the business. So when I left the program, we did, we did two things. Uh, the first thing is we went back and redid our key metrics and, and uh, started measuring profitability uh, as one of our key metrics because we, we feel that uh, if you focus and, and you create that culture that you have to a focus on profitability and increasing your EBITDA, you know, that's what's going to help uh, drive your business and help you in the growth of the, of the business. And then the other thing that I learned through the program is that um, I realized that I can't live forever. So I, I went back and I said, well, I, I told my wife, I said, I, I think I need to start thinking about an exit strategy. So, you know, I, 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 as much as I'd like to live forever, I don't think I don't think I am, but uh, uh, I started focusing on now, now uh, an exit strategy, and uh, uh, we're looking at several different options. Last year, we went through a very grueling process of uh, trying to sell part of our company and uh, learned a lot. So for you that are small business owners that are seeking to sell your business, if you want some advice, uh, I'm more than happy to provide some advice <laughs> and what not to do. Well, <laughs> Oscar, this is, this, I know this is going to be a short answer to the question, but I love this fact about your company. Tell us about the ownership structure of your company. Uh, well, the ownership, I own 51% and my wife owns 49%. Yes. It's right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a beautiful thing. And the only reason it's like that, okay, not, not, not for anything other than <laughs> when, when the attorney was first setting up our company, uh, he said, one of you has to be the majority owner. So I guess we flipped a coin and I won. So okay. I <laughs> I'm glad it was fair. <laughs> Brian, so tell us about your company. It's also an amazing story. Yeah, so, um, so I actually started Wild Earth actually with my co-founder, Abril Estrada, who's just in the audience right now. She's also went through the LBAN program. Um, we, uh, both Abril and I had this vision of uh, making better food for our pets. 
So it's kind of this deep insight. My background is I'm a biotech guy. I came up through biotechnology. I worked for big biotech companies, um, and I actually helped start a biotech accelerator. I started learning how biotech could actually make our world a little bit more sustainable, a little bit more healthy through food. It was kind of a surprise to me. I came from therapeutics. Um, and, um, and I had this really deep insight. I was like, what, what are we, you know, I, I'd grown up with, with dogs and cats my whole life. And I was like, they bring so much love and affection into our lives. And I was like, we're starting to care a lot more about what we eat. How are we feeding them? And when I started to look through the FDA inspection reports, and I, I started to go like, wait, there was a recall of 100 million units of dog food because there's euthanasia drug in it. Yeah. And I was like, how does euthanasia drug get into pet food? Right? Isn't it secure? And so I, I kind of fell down this rabbit hole. Brill and I started to look into this. And, and I was like, wait a minute, they're like euthanized horses, maybe dogs and cats in the, in the food. Um, it was really disgusting. Um, and then I started to find out more. I kept reading. I was like, wait, there's also, you know, where do you think, some of, where do you think the expired meat goes mm -hmm. in the grocery stores, right? That goes to pet food. When it goes bad, it goes into our pet's foods. And, and there were cases the FDA had found in a couple of cases that, that people were not taking off the plastic, you know, the styrofoam and the plastic that it comes in when you get a little, little ground beef, right? Because it's not safe, right? It's expired meat. It's gone bad. So they basically put that into a renderer, and the, it cooks the plastic and everything. We know plastic is carcinogenic, right, if you eat it. So I was like, how is this possible? It's like there's this, there's this, there's this safe food that we mostly eat, and then there's our pets, Food was totally terrible. And uh, I started to look into it. The sustainability aspect was crazy. Most people don't know this either. Like I, I seem to be, sometimes it seems like, like I don't know why people aren't talking about this. Um, our dogs and cats in the US uh, consume 25 to 30 percent, three zero, of the meat we eat in this country. Most people don't know that. It's like crazy. It's a big number. It's a very big number. So I was there, environmental impact, sustainability, health. And I was like, why isn't anyone doing something about this? And so, so I was like, I'm a, I'm a biotech guy. Like, I shouldn't be doing like pet food. I kept trying to give the idea away, and it just wouldn't go away. <laughs> right? You know, how, I mean, many of you know how it is. It's like yeah. someone else should do this, not me. Um, I love animals. I care deeply about animals. I care about our planet and about the people on it. And so I was like, okay, I guess. I have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I started a plant-based dog food company, right? And most people are like, plant-based dog food? Most people don't know that dogs are omnivores like us. They can survive and thrive on a plant-based diet. Um, the important thing is the, you know, the proteins that go in. They have to have uh, high-quality proteins, and we do that through a really interesting, simple insight. We actually use fungi, so yeast plus plants. Mm -hmm. Yeast is about 40% protein. Uh, a good steak is about 30% um, uh, protein. So high in protein, but super clean. And that was, the, that was the really basic insight. And so I started this crazy idea, um, and I was like, no one's going to back this. And I went to see a bunch of VCs. I knew them because I'd, I'd kind of been involved in building uh, some other future food companies. And they were like, if you do a cancer startup or you do a future of human food startup, we'll back you. If you do this, we're not backing you. <laughs> Right? Like, we're just not backing you. Like, like, pet food's not interesting. We don't, you know, we love pets, but we don't think there's a problem. I was like, okay. And then funnily enough, um, three women investors that I knew, uh, funny, uh, ended up talking to them. All the, all the male VCs initially that I talked to, except for one, uh, Iden from Felicis, basically said, this is a crazy idea. No one cares about pets. No one cares about the environment. They're not actually going to buy this stuff. Um, and and uh, uh, Amy from Veg Invest. Lisa from Stray Dog, and Sonia, who f was our first angel investor, and with brought in um, Felicis Ventures, they backed us. So our first million, we raised it off this crazy idea of like plant-based dog food that's better for the dogs and for the environment, right? And really crazy. <laughs> and, and, and it was, it was you know, the women who understood that people really care about their pets and they're part of the family, and, and they cared about the environment too, and they were willing to back this mission. You know, we're a mission-driven company. Like, we, we exist because people care, right? That's why we exist. That's why people buy a product. Um, we launched, uh, we wanted to get traction, so I got... You launched with just that one million. We launched with just that one, well, so we started with one million. Okay. Uh, and I quickly learned I had no idea how to make dog food. Uh, a neither did a brill. 
And it turned out it was really expensive to make dog food, um, and it was really hard. And in the Midwest, people were turning us away going, who are you guys? This is crazy. Uh, we're not going to help you with you know, like building and scaling this crazy thing. No one wants plant-based dog food anyway. And so we're like, OK, this is great. Um, and so, so, so basically, we, um, we kept going. And uh, I was able to get onto Shark Tank. Uh, really crazy. I, but you, let me just to clarify, yeah. you're still at zero revenue. At this we're still at zero revenue. Okay. Zero revenue. Okay. We have this idea. We're having all sorts of problems with the science, by the way. So we're like brewing this koji. It's like a type of fungi. We're doing some yeast stuff. Our science was a mess. Um, we were having a lot of problems. Uh, and we went on a shark tank. And I got on a shark tank. I auditioned like three different times. I'm not an actor. Uh, and so I was like, this is, this is like being an actor, going on stage all live action, uh, went on. Uh, Mr. Wonderful made lots of great jokes. Uh, 3.6 million people saw us that night. Uh, we became a nationwide brand overnight. Mark Cuban actually invested in us and backed us, which blew my mind. You know, one of the questions, I, I can't remember if it was Mr. Wonderful, Damon asked, they were like, how much, uh, you know, how much revenue ha have you got? And I was like, none, zero. We haven't even launched. It's like, if, if you watch Shark Tank and you're a fan, you know that the ground rules are you need, to, you need to make money, you need to have a product on the market. We had none of those. And I was like, I'm just going to get like fried up here on stage. And then at least I'll walk off. As long as I don't do something really, really stupid, I'll be OK. Did your company even have a valuation at that time? Or did you raise it on we a did. safe? No, we did. Okay. So we raised some safes. And then we got a valuation, which I also got dinged for. So I was able to tell some really good stories. And I was able to get a great VC, Felicis, to lead uh, our investment. And then, um, and then I, I was able to get Peter Thiel uh, interested. I, I basically told him I thought I could help dogs live longer. And he was like, that's interesting, right? Tell me more about that. I was like, clean food helps you live longer, right? Uh, and so he's like, yes, I'm in. Did and you have science for that claim, or did yeah, you? Yeah, no, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay. there's actually some anecdotal science. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't take him for a ride, you know, but I, I kind of. I, I threw the vision out there. It's you hard know, to take it for a little bit of, Yeah, I had a little bit of science to it as well. Yeah. Um, we'd seen some anecdotal evidence that actually dogs' lifespans on, on actually plant-based diets, uh, lentils, rice, and yeast, yeah. uh, had actually, they actually lived a lot longer. Yeah. Really surprising. Um, there was a, a dog that lived to 20, 25 years of age, 25, 27 years of age. Wow. So it was really crazy, really crazy. So anecdotal, not deeply scientific, but anecdotal. And so, uh, yeah. so we went with a huge like valuation, $11 million. Everyone thought we were crazy. No revenue, no product. Uh, Mark actually said, look, if I invest in you, will you launch a product by the time we air? And I was like, yes. And that's when Abril was like, what did you just Depends do? on how you define launch. Yeah, yeah so okay. we, launched, we launched our treats on the night that it aired. Um, we had a great night. Um, and then we've been scaling. So since we've launched, and I think this is a really important thing with the Stanford program, what we learned was you know, a lot of insights on scaling. It's really, really hard to understand how to scale, especially if you're used to, you know, in the Latino community, you, you're used to seeing lots of like plumbers and some doctors and like those are successful people, electricians. Um, they build their businesses organically. Mm -hmm. Scaling is not something that you see anyone, at least I didn't see anyone that I knew when I grew up scaling a business rapidly. Yeah. Um, and the Stanford program helped me understand, the LBAN program helped me understand how to scale aggressively, and it's super scary, mm -hmm. right? So, so we embraced that fully. We we're like, we're gonna do the scariest thing we can possibly do, uh, which is grow. And we're gonna grow, and we're gonna grow as fast as we can, and we're gonna try and really be like this breakout brand. We wanna be the- Grow with attention to the top line? To with the, well, so, so here's the catch. Okay. When you grow, it's a delicate balance between your margins on your cogs and your growth. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's like, oh, well, you have to be profitable and grow fast. <laughs> yeah. The reality of it is no. <laughs> that, like that. that you, it's, happen. it's a dance. Trade -off. It's a dance. It's yeah. a trade off. And so, I mean, last year, every month on month, we were growing 50% month on month. Okay. Right? Wow. So 50% wow. month on month. And so, so do you do deals directly with, with supermarket chains? Or how does so we this get work? this? Okay. So we learned a really interesting lesson. We went into retail, terrible place for an upstart uh, dog mm -hmm. food brand. Turns out the big four food companies, you'll, you'll know them. They'll just have different brand names. Mars, Nestle, General Mills, uh, Smuckers, weirdly, um, it, you know, are all dog food. The leaders, that's the top four or five dog food companies are also the top four or five human food companies globally. 
Um, if we battle it out with them, they know how to play that game on shelves. Sure. We're lost. Mm -hmm. So we went direct to consumer. Okay. So we learned how to sell to consumers, and we learned that actually this, this transformation that's happening in the economy was really helpful for us. Mm -hmm. And so we've been able to scale primarily online. So we talk to consumers, we provide them with lots of information. If we're a bag on the shelf, we can't tell our story. Right. Um, but what we've been able to tell our story. And so um, scaling has been super scary. Um, you know, everything breaks as you scale. So, you know, the business that you are at five is not the business you are at, at 10, which is not the business that you are at 15. We're currently at 20 people. Um, we're nationwide. We sell in all 50 states. We have a total of 60 stores, mostly on the West Coast, some uh, outside of the West Coast. We have a handful that are outside of the West Coast. And it's really crazy. It feels like a new company every month. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's challenging. Do you sell on Instagram as well? Or? We sell on Instagram. Yeah, we, we do a lot of social media. We sell through social media. We had to learn a lot of things we didn't know. Um, Abril came from the food world, um, and um, you know, she knew how to make human food products, but we didn't know how to make you know, pet food products. It's an entirely different world. And so we had to learn with a lot of great people. I mean, you know, we built Wild Earth with support from an entire community. Um, one, one interesting thing that I, that I actually learned was that uh, advice comes from surprising places sometimes. I went into Shark Tank thinking that would get us exposure, we'd get a check, that would be great. Um, you know, Mark Cuban, he, he and I talk, mostly email, but talk about once a week. Mm -hmm. And he kind of became a mentor mm -hmm. through this process. So he's a very critical mentor. Everything I did was terrible and wrong. And, <laughs> and when he was silent, I did a good job, right? So I was like, okay, I, at least I have something to work for. Uh -huh. um, but it was a type of mentorship, something that I really didn't have. And so, you know, I think that, I think that for, for all of us who don't necessarily have role models, for people who understand how to scale businesses, and I mean everyone, right? I mean, we, you know, I know this is a Latino uh, uh, program, but I, you know, I, I, I think that there's a huge opportunity for us to build incredible things that are positive for our world, whoever you are, you know, a woman, a minority, a white, a white man, like, it's all okay. Like, there's incredible things um, that can be built if you will give yourself permission to like take the risk, take the chance. It's really scary. That's how it feels when you build a business. Yeah. It's let's, scary. Let's talk about some of those scary moments for everybody. So we've all been entrepreneurs. And I'll start with you, Dolmarie. You talked about the brutality of raising that $3 million. And I certainly remember the experience of we're going to run out of money in two weeks if we don't raise yes. money. So that's, that's when I learned that $1 million is like $5 in your pocket. Mm. Um, so we got first, um, we, we've been like under getting like all the free money available in the, from the government. And Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory. And we, are, we, are, um, we can request for every grant available for, for in healthcare, tech. And we have many, many verticals that we can go and classify our, you know, the company in many, many ways because of the technology. We process clinical data for uh, patients in Puerto Rico and, and now in the States. And we manage uh, provider networks. With that, I mean hospital, private practice. And I can tell you that in our case studies, um, what the, why we got the investment with was when we proved to the investors that 33% of your lab results goes to the wrong person. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we were like, oh my God, how are we going to implement our technology if the results are going to the wrong person? Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And that's how we stopped like, the whole development. And we spoke with a few mentors, as always. And we decided to change the, the, the development and timeline. And we decided to uh, go as an identity validator technology um, to start because we had to go back to the basics. So we had to fix the insurance company's issues, the pharma's issues, because they don't have access, they don't have visual, any visualization of what is going on out there with the, you know, with the patients that use their drugs. And then we said, okay, we have like, everything to manage members, patients. Then we present, we, we pitch to a few investors, they said, oh, that's like great. We got 562 from our angel investor. 
he believed in the in the you know what we were doing. I almost died because of a bad experience because of like lack of data. I had a sepsis, so I promised that I was gonna die, like, uh, but I had to like fix this um, problem because I lived that. I said goodbye to my whole family. Uh, my weight was 81 pounds. I lost my hair, and I almost died. So that's me. That I know the answers that I have to ask. Imagine someone that they don't, a patient that they don't, you know, that they don't know what to ask to a doctor. Then we went to insurance companies with all this amazing solution for visualization of clinical data for some specific markets that they need to learn about them. And then they said, good, then let's upload into our technology of the providers. Oh my God, when we did that was worst. Mm -hmm. So more than 51% of the providers that are treating patients are the ground providers. No documents up to date, no credentials up to date, no, nothing. You had like a generalist um, treating a diabetic, like a chronic diabetic, or someone with HIV or hepatitis C, uh, it, disaster. And the way that they classify that is there's no way that you can track the provider that is treating that patient, a whole disaster. So we went back to another set of mentors and they said, chicas, um, chicas is like girls, because I don't know why they call us like that. They like it. Um, you have like another problem because you need to fix, apparently you have to do the same that you did for the patients. So are you running out of money at this point? Yes, of okay. course. Yeah. We were like negative, but we didn't miss a payment, a payroll either, nope. because I found my angel investor, he believed in what we were doing. It's all and one he told me, yes. investor until one, okay. yes. yes. Okay. And he told me, I believe in like in this, your vision, because you you are living like everything you have because of this, with a family, a good salary. And he said, you know, just tell me what do you need and come here every 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 week, every like every 15 days for your payroll, and I will give you the money. At away. what point did you move beyond the angel investor who's funding the company? Six months. Okay. And he kept us alive for six months. Okay. Yeah. And we fixed like the issue with the with the providers. We had a great team of uh, engineers. My partner and I were not engineers at all. And so, but we hired. We did the same that. Did your angel investor ever say you've got to find another investor at this point? Or? Yes. Yes. He said, I can, I'm just at an angel point, investor. Right, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Not the bank. And you yeah. found the other investors. Not your personal bank, yes. You found the other investors just in time. Yes, but he said, I, had, I have a good friend that he almost died because of another dramatic situation, and I am sure that he will be interested. It's a 500 million equity firm, private equity. Yeah. And I pitched him, and they said, they said the same. I almost died because of something similar to what happened to you. Yeah. Good. Do you want to give us money? We need one million. <laughs> you made it. You, you, yeah. so you made it personal. It, and was yes. that the three million dollar round? No, that's a one point five million dollar round. Okay. Then the government was in that moment sponsoring us, like like their poster child company. We went to accelerator. We went to South by Southwest. We had a ton of great media, and when we went back to Puerto Rico. We were in like all the newspapers, media everywhere, but they were not giving us money. Yeah. Like, hey, if you want us to be like your poster child, you need to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the money. It's, and it's we applied for you. everything. We got five hey, we got five hundred and sixty five. That's it. That's so it. Was. So that's we closed one point five dollars round. Yeah. We fixed the issues with the provide with the providers, but we didn't have money still to pay like one hundred thousand dollars to engineers. Yeah. Because we compete with Silicon Valley here. Yeah. Like, so are you cash flow positive now? Or? I will be next month. Wow. Wow. Yes. That, that's huge. Yes. So let, that is an amazing event. And so for yes. anybody, so I think, Oscar, you, you were cash flow positive with liquidity challenges, but the whole time. So, right. 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 And so, Martha, what's your story? Scary. <laughs> I'll, tell you what's, I'll tell you what's scary that we all should be scared. The, the real reason we... I started Actools was traveling the world and watching farmers go away. We are losing farmers by the truckloads, not because yep. of China issue. It's just the business model is not proper. Yeah. Do we want? 
I, I tell people, if you want to buy a potato or a tomato, you want to see it, you want to touch it. Same thing is in the industry. You send that truckload and it has a price, but it doesn't get finished until it delivers into the distribution center. Yeah. So if it doesn't get delivered, it gets rejected, it gets in a storm, whatever it is, that farmer has to pay the truck, the boxes, the cooling, everything. So instead of making money, they end up with a five to ten to fifteen thousand dollar bill. Yeah. So the old the, the old generations used to work like this. I mean the baby boomers, but the young generations are saying, this is not a good business model. So is your is your capital raise? Tell us a little bit about the capital raise. We but don't so, have that so much the, time. So hear me there. So what yeah. happened is that watching all these farmers going away. I was today data is that we have five we have five million workers in Mexico, feeding 190 habitants in Mexico. So you see that this balance that yep. these are the people feeding us in the United States, the same thing. So when I saw uh, traveling the world and seeing that, I said, we need to do something about it. And remember, I was doing the business model. And when I came here, I said, how do we not only raise our from 8% to more percentage of growth, but also how do we help the industry? Yep. And so the, the Act Tools has some mission behind it. And we always say it's about the farmer. But who makes the decisions are the retailer buyers, the food service industry buyers. Yes. And if they don't make the right decision, it triggers down, down to the farmer. So what we did is I found my angel investors, women, that believe in the social impact more than the business side of it. Okay. And so between Janet, Marcela, and Betty, the three Latinas, they understand that they're supporting me, they're backing me up because they understand that there's a bigger mission than just the business side of it. And have you moved beyond the angel investors, or is that? We curious? are finishing the angel investor. We're still raising angel investment. But I have to tell you that when you talk about mentors, mentors come in many shapes and forms, right? Mm -hmm. Mentors are also inside corporate America. Yep. And I have found amazing mentors inside corporate America that guide us. Or even, I'll give you an example of us two days ago, I called one of my bigger buyers of one of the bigger retailers, because one of our angel investors want to talk about a business model, and she said, yes, tell them to call me and I'll tell them why your product is good. Yes. So that's an angel investor for us. It's an angel mentor in a Which different amount of shape. inspiration. So even our buyers are my mentors in some shape or form. So in the one minute that we've got left, would each, a lightning round, I know we didn't talk about this, but just, one bit of advice, your top tip to everyone in the audience. I'll start with you, Ryan. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's literally give yourself permission. No one else will. Yep. Right? So when you start a business, there's many reasons why you should never start a business. Yeah. Lots and lots of rational, rational people don't start businesses, but um, <laughs> you should still give yourself permission. I love that one. Yeah. Oscar. Uh, just be relentless with, uh, and have a passion for what you do and never give up. You know, always have that that power to get up in the morning and, and keep going. Martha. For me, it's the team. Bring team members that believe in the cause because every single day you're going to wake up with them and for them, but with them, and when you say payroll and all that, it's them who are going to be part of that. Don Marie. Yeah, so in my case, I think that you need to be unstoppable. Unstoppable and, and use all that ne negativity on your favor and take it and make it positive. And, and just let them talk and tell them we'll talk later. And, and again, there's an investor for every stage. So you need to be with engaged investors that really believe in what you're yeah. doing, not just take their money. So amazing that we've got such different business models, but a unifying theme in this advice. And I'll summarize it with the best advice I ever got from my mother, similar to what you said. You know, there's all the naysayers out there. Mm -hmm. Que dirá la gente? Mm -hmm. And my mom would always say, que digan misa si pueda. Yeah, that was the one. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.